Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I'm very grateful to have Jason Kaliva on the show. I say Kaliva like that because I'm kind of like, did I pronounce that right? I'm very well known for pronouncing names terribly. So I hope I did all right on that. <laughs> no, no, you actually did. That was that was pretty good. Most people, <laughs> uh, most people butcher it. So that was, that was pretty, pretty damn close. I, for whatever reason, names just throw me off massively, especially some last names. I'm just like, okay, I don't know how to say this. So anyway, Jason's on the show. And uh, if you don't know Jason, you might have heard his name thrown around. I, I certainly have actually for a while. It was only recently I kind of dug a bit deeper into who Jason was and kind of uh, his expertise and things like this. And I was like, oh, I want to get Jason on the show because I, I have heard your name come up within kind of, I guess, the evidence based sphere and if we want to call it that and things like this. So Jason himself is a sports scientist. So he is a professor of exercise science at the University of Lynchburg. He's a coach himself um, and an athlete. And uh, I know having just heard you actually on Lane Norton's podcast, you were once on the bodybuilding forums, bodybuilding.com forums, and uh, you're an aspiring bodybuilder yourself at one point. Did you, did you actually ever compete, Jason? I did. I competed, well, when I actually was able to and got around to competing, it was in physique. And it was when physique first kind of came out on the scene in 2000 seven i want to say 2008 and it was the world natural sports org and at that point uh at least in this competition physique athletes were in posing trunks and then we wore costumes as well so i dressed up right. as a caveman and you know like <laughs> amazing <laughs> kind of floating around yeah i think uh i've seen some sh there are some shows like that like the wbff like it's a like a like a beauty federation a little bit more where they do those sort of rounds. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, bodybuilding on, on its own is kind of a bit of a beauty pageant anyway, when you throw in that sort of thing, it kind of starts. How did you feel about that? Is that, was that like something you enjoyed or were you more about kind of showing the physique and, you know, I, I thought the costume part was kind of fun. Um, I am not a very good poser. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I, I really enjoyed the, the preparation and process of getting into that shape and watching my body transform uh, a lot more than the actual competition itself. So that was kind of my one and done. I didn't really enjoy the competition. So, you know, yeah. why, why do another one? But I really did enjoy the, the process of, uh, of, of conditioning and, and, and getting into that kind of shape. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, if you don't enjoy that part, it's a, a big deal because <laughs> that's the, the majority of what you're doing there. So um, it's good that at least you enjoyed that. And I know uh, I said you're a coach and I, I don't know a lot about who you coach. What's the kind of a, like clientele you typically coach, Jason? I've, I've coached all kinds of clientele from uh, highly competitive athletes um, in various sports, soccer, handball, uh, lacrosse, um, some of your more common sports like football and, and baseball, um, as well as general population people um, throughout the years, some MMA, MMA athletes. But right now, I coach predominantly physique athletes or people with uh, physique aspirations. And most of my clients at the moment uh, tend to be female. Um, that just kind of organically came about for, for whatever reason. So a lot of bikini competitors is, is my current clientele. Very cool. Yeah. It's, it's in, in some ways it's nice when it, they, the client kind of finds you and you find your little kind of the niche almost that, but well, you're kind of a niche in a niche in a way, um, uh, kind of compete with uh, bikini competitors, but it's nice when that happens. Cause then you really get to specialize. You really understand like the in-depth of what it takes to get that person to be their best. So uh, it's really not cool to hear that that's kind of the person you help. Yeah. Along the years, I've, I mean, I don't, you know, coaching isn't my primary income. It's not my full-time job. Uh, being a professor is, um, I enjoy coaching and it, 
allows me to stay sharp and you know apply what I learn, which I really enjoy. Uh, so over the years, I've become pretty selective in who I take on as clients, not so much in their level of uh, physique development or ability to compete, but more so just making sure it's the right client coach fit. Yeah, I, I, I respect that a lot. And I think it's quite nice when you're in the position you are where you can be a bit selective. I know at the st- like if you are full time and you're at the start, like you have to take on everyone. And, and like you say there, like everyone doesn't fit maybe your methodologies or what have you. Maybe online coaching isn't even suitable for them. I, I assume it actually is based online. Is that right? Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I kind of skipped ahead there, but I was kind of just intrigued to to know more about you. But how did you, what, what was kind of your, what got you into health, fitness? What made you want to be a, a kind of get your PhD and become an exercise scientist? All right, so let's go the abbre- abbreviated route here. You can get um, the long story on lanes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's back it up to like 13, 12 year old Jason, uh, awkward ginger boy with big hands and big ears and a big nose and no idea how to interact socially, especially with the opposite sex. So I thought if I started lifting and got buff, I would get girls. And I I stuck with the lifting and working out and increasing my muscle mass, uh, but it did not help at all in terms of like uh, any sort of success with the opposite sex. Um, But anyways, it it did kind of develop a a passion in terms of especially uh, bodybuilding and physique development. And so uh, initially when I went to undergrad, I was really interested in dietary supplements at the time. Uh, in my, you know, late teenage, early twenties, uh, I tried just about every type of dietary supplement. And so I really wanted to, to design them. And, uh, and, and I, in the process of getting my undergrad degree, uh, kind of was a horrible student, like as a professor, I would look back at me now and, uh, just shake my head. <laughs> so yeah, I, I got kind of a nonsense degree in communications, but, uh, anyways, got out of undergrad and, and had some sales jobs and, and really didn't enjoy it very much. And always just kind of went back to, to working out. And that was kind of like how I would spend a lot of my days at work was thinking about what kind of workout I wanted to do and, Etc. And so eventually I just kind of decided to follow my passion and wanted to be a, a strength and conditioning coach at a collegiate or a professional level. So did some undergrad non matriculating classes just to show that my abysmal GPA as an undergrad wasn't like what I am and capable of and started. Uh, in a master's program in strength and conditioning. And then I fell in love more with the science than actually coaching. Um, people who aren't aware of what strength coaches do, it's, uh, it's a very involved job. They're often underappreciated, especially at that collegiate level. Uh, that's a topic for a, another time, but I, I fell in love with the science and uh, you know, I just went on to get my, my PhD and here I am now. I think it's really interesting. Like a lot of people get into it for similar reasons, kind of like, I don't know if it's the girls or confidence or anything like that. And then it's like, it, it never comes to the person's awareness that it could be a career until they try different jobs. And it's like, oh man, I'm really into this one thing. And then you kind of pursue it further. So it's it's really cool to hear that's kind of how, you got into things and funny actually that you had like the, I guess, lack of confidence and social skills. Then you went into sales or something that sounds like going right in the deep end. (laughs) (laughs) And and you mentioned there supplements were something you really wanted to look into. And I, I know your PhD and your dissertation in there was within betaine, which I think at least some of the audience will be aware of as I think it's grown in popularity over at least the last few years. And, um, something I'd be interested to hear a bit about and, uh, just in general pre-workouts i'm sure that's something that I, I know that's something that you've looked into quite a bit and i just from the get-go like to start it with just some of the history because I, I saw a presentation by you i think it was for the issn on youtube and you talked about kind of like 
people have been or i guess athletes or what have you have been using kind of a type of pre-workout for a long time so yeah if you want to start from like there and then we move forward talk about some of the the different ingredients and things like this yeah absolutely so we go back to i guess like ancient humans or you know a lot of uh hunter-gatherer tribes um that used had various beliefs, superstitions about uh, consumptions um, and how it might, you know, give them success in a hunt, um, as well as, you know, sometimes psychedelic drugs or I shouldn't say psychedelic drugs, but plants with psychedelic properties, et cetera. Um, you know, the Aztecs used to Central American indigenous people used to chew cocoa leaves as a, as a way to improve their performance. Um, but what we really see is in the time of the Greeks, where the use of a little bit more of an empirical method uh, comes about, and as well as looking more into a uh, regimented training for the, the athletes in the Olympic Games. Um, and so the most popular pre-workout in that time period uh, was bull testicles. So they believed that, um, and you know, almost rightly so, obviously it doesn't pan out like or translate to any improved performance, but you know, they believed that there was something about the testicle that, that gave the bull its uh, its aggression and strength, et cetera. And so they believe that if they consume these, uh, the, these organs that it would improve their performance. And so uh, Milo of Crete, who we often talk about in terms of progressive overload, who started carrying a little calf as a child and by an adult was able to carry a full grown bull. The story goes at the end, he slaughtered that bull and ate the testicles as a uh, a means to improve his wrestling performance. So that's really where we first kind of see this idea that consuming certain foods or compounds can improve performance. Um, and then we see it in the gladiator years where they consumed the plant strychnos and that plant contained uh, strychnine, which happens to be what is used in rat poisoning, but in very low doses, it is uh, a stimulant. Um, and so they consume that to improve their performance. Um, in Africa, Zulu warriors were consuming um, an elixir and it was uh, a nut that contained caffeine. And, and I forget the other fruit that they were consuming prior to battle. Then we fast forward to the turn of the 20th century where sport kind of picked back up um, during the dark ages, sport was essentially outlawed, at least in, you know, the European world. Um, and so with the turn of the 20th century, uh, interest in sport picked back up. And so did uh, the, the use of various compounds that were believed to improve performance. And if you look at the cyclists in the very early 1900s, uh, their pre-workout of choice was an elixir of cocaine and strychnose as well. So wow. cocaine and rat poisoning, <laughs> you know, exactly what you want in your, in your pre-workout mix. That's, uh, it's hilarious to think about that trend, how, how far we've come again since then, but also a lot of these kind of uh, populations were already like seeking out caffeine and just finding it in places uh, I guess I don't know if they knew, I guess they didn't know it was caffeine at the time. And I guess it's uh, a really interesting way to even show how kind of, in a sense, bro science kind of works in that, like people are just out there trying to find stuff that's working and then later we test. And that's what drives science in many ways. And that's, I guess it, it leads into that. And I know, I, I imagine, I, well, and I do know, uh, as time has gone on, like we have found many more supplements that have potential um, to improve our kind of acute ergogenic performance before a session. But how, how I know you, you assessed a lot of them. And I think, I mean, I see it, I'm deep in the bodybuilding industry. And especially, 
I don't know if it's more in the natural scene, but natural bodybuilders like want any su- supplement that's like natural that can give them an edge. So there's loads of pre-workouts that sell really well, pump formulas, all of these different things. Um, I don't know if you want to start with some of the ones I've listed here or maybe some of the ones people have heard of, but they're not sure where they go. So I don't know if you want to start with something like arginine or something like that and kind of if you can kind of go through some of them and I can always kind of give you the next one if you're unsure what would be a good one to cover next, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, Let, let's do that. So, um, you know, we published a paper uh, several years ago looking at the, it was a review article, so it was mostly theoretical, uh, but the muscle pump and how it might relate to muscle protein synthesis. And when I say the muscle pump, I mean the muscle pump um, in terms of cellular swelling and, and, and an increase in intracellular and inter, interstitial fluid um, that gives you that like pumped feeling that you get after doing a set of bicep curls, for example. Um, and then we looked at or talked about some supplements that might uh, enhance that muscle pump. And so one classification of those supplements were compounds that may improve vasodilation and blood flow. And so arginine has been long thought of as a compound that might do that uh, by increasing the amount of nitric oxide in the blood. Um, however, what we find is arginine's ability to increase nitric oxide or, or nitrates and vasodilation is, is pretty small. So as far as a a compound that may enhance the muscle pump and may have an impact on either performance or uh, post-exercise protein synthesis and adaptation. Uh, there's not a lot of hope for arginine. Yeah. Um, and we looked at some compounds that, for example, nitrates consumed in the form of most commonly uh, beetroot juice. And so nitrate is broken down into nitrite and then into nitric oxide. And, and that will have some vasodilator or dilatory effects. Um, number of studies have been done that have looked at nitric oxide, or I should say you know, the consumption of organic nitrates um, and resistance exercise performance. And for the most part, they really don't show much of a benefit. Uh, so it doesn't really appear that there is much of a benefit to increasing vasodilation during resistance exercise, at least not in healthy adults. Yeah, I think it's nitrates are one of the ones that at least recently have become more popular. And I've seen like, uh, I think people are looking for ways of consuming it that isn't just like beetroot juice and everything, but it doesn't seem like there is an easy way to even get hold of that. And uh, I don't. Do you think the research has covered that well enough to say nitrates unlikely to improve like hypertrophy outcomes, or do you feel like maybe uh, that there is some because based off the mechanistic research that it does vasodilate and that should improve cell swelling that possibly <laughs> that there could be uh, it could be something worth a punt at. I don't know. I, I don't really want to say anything definitively. Um, there is some research that it improves the oxygen cost of exercise. Um, uh, now, whether that would translate into increased resistance exercise performance, so an improvement in like load volume over the course of a session. And, you know, if you have a greater load volume consistently, that could translate into greater muscle hypertrophy. But Again, we're talking theoretically, and I'm not aware of any chronic studies. That doesn't mean they're not out there. I'm just uh, not, not aware of them. So I think my own personal opinion that beetroot juice, as far as enhancing muscle hypertrophy and the muscle pump, probably better to save your money than to spend it on that, that compound for, for resistance exercise performance. I mean, there's a lot of studies that show benefits and repeat sprints and, and aerobic exercise, but not so much resistance. Yeah, I think at least you can assume most of the time when I'm asking you questions, I'm all, only interested in muscle hypertrophy. And I think that's this like specific audience that we serve. So if, if you're happy, 
you i guess you can always mention if it's going to help other things but uh yeah it's it's good to hear that because yeah i guess people uh, it's an interesting topic in itself where people see like oh this has a sports performance benefit beetroot juice maybe in some sports but we're after if you're a bodybuilder does that actually apply to you and i guess one of those that i find interesting because i think it's clearly does something but it's whether or not it helps bodybuilding and that's better alanine not that necessarily that's something that you have to have in a pre-workout because uh, as at least i think a lot of the audience will know it's something you want more long term to have the chronic effect from that but it's in tons of pre-workouts so i guess that that would be a, a nice one to cover what are your kind of what does the research show there and what are your thoughts behind it for bodybuilders I think it's put in pre-workouts just to make you tingle, to, to give that sensation yeah. that something is is happening. Um, beta alanine is an interesting one because there's a lot of mechanistic and theoretical rationale for beta alanine to have an impact on especially the type of training that is typically performed to uh, to increase muscle hypertrophy. So we're looking at higher repetition, shorter rest periods, you know, uh, sets that last 30 seconds or longer when we're talking eight or more repetitions. So we're generating a lot of metabolites. Um, and given that the, when, when you are doing resistance training, um, the muscle is kind of partially occluded throughout almost the entire set. So if you imagine doing a, a bicep curl, for example, during the concentric portion of the phase, the muscle is contracted. And so that contraction is compressing blood vessels and, and limiting some of the uh, inflow and outflow of blood. And then unlike high intensity intermittent training or interval training, um, such as sprinting or cycling, where the muscle is then relaxing and contracting and relaxing and contracting, during resistance training, for most of the exercises, the muscle is still contracted during the eccentric portion as you're lowering that weight. And so for the duration of the set, the vessels are slightly compressed or partially compressed and partially occluded. So this does limit blood flow to an extent. Um, and so with less blood flow, you would think that there would be less hydrogen efflux out of the cell compared to say uh, repeat sprinting. Um, and so an even greater uh, potential for an intracellular buffer um, like carnosine, which beta alanine has been shown to increase within the muscles uh, to buffer some of those hydrogen ions to have a performance enhancing effect. So there's a lot of mechanistic and theoretical rationale for this. However, when you look at the research, most of the studies, and there's some that do show a benefit, but most of the studies don't show a performance benefit with beta alanine supplementation. Um, and this goes for testing higher repetition work and lower repetition work. And one of the studies we did, uh, we looked at the effects of beta alanine supplementation on strength endurance and on uh, lean body mass. And we found no improvements as a result of beta alanine supplementation. So I, I'm not very, uh, in terms of recommending beta alanine as a supplement, it's certainly not gonna have a harmful effect, but whether it has a beneficial effect on resistance exercise performance strength outcomes and muscle hypertrophy, it's probably limited. I don't wanna say it's not gonna have any effect, but most of the research tends to show that it's probably not a beneficial supplement to take for those applications. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. I think that was really well explained. It's it's one of those ones that I 
had always kind of taken and thought, oh, I'll use it for when I am maybe doing a particular block that's going to be more high repetition, maybe more kind of pump focus in the sense that I'm doing like lighter weights, shorter rest periods. I remember talking to Mike Isretel about it years ago, and he was kind of saying like, part of the reason you're doing those though is for the metabolite build up. And if you are getting something that's buffering that away, surely you're just working harder to get the same result. I, very theoretical, but like you said there, the, the research isn't really showing it's necessarily going to benefit you. And it, it kind of made me a lot more skeptical when I combined that with his thoughts of maybe it's actually just making you work harder to get <laughs> to the outcome that you're looking to achieve anyway. Yeah. It, you know, the, what, what's really surprising to me is, is really the lack of strength endurance benefits yeah. from big Allen and supplementation that more studies than, than not show no benefit. That's really, it's, it's super interesting because I feel like it's one of those supplements that has been uh, within the evidence based sphere for a long time. And that's like, everyone just assumes it is having that benefit, me included. So it's very interesting to know that actually the research as a whole isn't necessarily pointing that direction. So, and so far we have no supplements that we're particularly looking, looking to include in our pre-workout apart from maybe caffeine that we've kind of talked about. But one of the ones uh, that has got, I think kind of a mixed review in terms of evidence and kind of similar to what arginine does is citrulline malate. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Of course, you're looking at L-citrulline or citrulline and L-malate uh, combined in a supplement. So, so two different uh, derivatives of amino acids, et cetera. Um, and malate plays a role in the malate aspartamate shuttle. So it may improve uh, aerobic exercise. And then it also may have a buffering effect. Um, and so this is a supplement that kind of has a mixed bag as well in terms of resistance exercise performance and, and some studies showing a benefit and some studies showing no benefit. Although it seems like more studies tend to show a benefit to citrulline malate supplementation in terms of acute performance than not. It, it does appear that for it to have an effect, it needs to pretty be a pretty high volume uh, resistance exercise session um, with higher repetitions and you know, moderate rest periods as well. When I say higher repetitions, eight to fifteen, not like you know thirty repetition sets. Although maybe it does benefit that as well. Uh, whether that improvement in in repetitions and volume translates into increases in in lean mass and muscle hypertrophy, uh, I'm not aware of any research that, that's looked at a chronic effect. The thing about citrulline malate is, uh, number one, you gotta take about six to eight grams of it acutely to have an effect. So it's a pretty big dose. Uh, number two, it gives an acidic taste pretty quickly. And so if you wanna mix your pre-workout and then like drink it an hour later, it's going to taste a lot different than if you mixed it and drank it right away. Uh, and the same goes if you open that pre-workout and that powder is exposed to any kind of, of humidity. It'll become clumpy and take on an, uh, an acidic type of a flavor pretty quickly. Uh, so just something to consider in terms of citrulline malate in your pre-workout. Number one, you need a large dose. And number two, uh, you know, a lot of companies probably don't put in the necessary effective dose for that reason. It's going to be kind of sour. Yeah, it's, uh, it's again, interesting that the, the research is mixed on it. It's certainly not one, I guess this is one you'd be more likely to put money towards versus some of the other ones we're going to discuss. But uh, like it is expensive when you need to take that amount, which I mean, further explains why companies might not want to put a huge dosage in there, uh, which is unfortunate. I know a lot of pre-workouts now are when they do include it, they're like sour cherry or sour apple <laughs> because of to take to make up for that flavor. So I know I've used it in the past. And I mean, like any supplement, you're never going to really notice that much, but I did notice the acidity in particular. Yeah. The, the, so the study that we did 
uh, looking at a pre-workout versus a placebo versus caffeine matched. We were trying to make sure that the supplement and the placebo tasted the same. And one thing we found was that like the longer, this was before we understood that citrulline malate gave that acidic flavor. Like we, we, we'd create the two drinks and we'd pour some in a cup and have people try it and see if they could distinguish. And it was like the people who came in last were able to distinguish and the people who came in first weren't. And so I talked to the, the owner of the company and that's when I learned about that effect of, of citrulline malate. I was like, why, why is it that every time we do our pilot work, uh, the first people can't tell the difference, but the, you know, the people who come in at the end can. Amazing. That's yeah. I guess some of the, the little quirks that you don't realize in, in research when you're having to take it, that you have to take into consideration such things. Cause I guess even things like creatine, like they have a powdery kind of texture and things. So very interesting. One I, I definitely want to cover as well. Uh, and I think maybe widely most used in like um, energy drinks is taurine. See mm. those in uh, the majority of energy drinks. I'd love to hear more about taurine. So taurine, I haven't done any research in taurine personally. Okay. Um, and it's not something I'm really familiar with. Um, but yeah, it, you see it everywhere, usually paired with, with caffeine. And if I remember correctly, it maybe has a slight benefit on improvement or sorry, on endurance when taking in, in high doses. But in terms of uh, resistance exercise, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not, I don't really feel comfortable commenting on that. Yeah, I, I don't think from, I, I watched your presentation not long ago and it, it wasn't one of the ones that you were kind of too sure about uh within the presentation so uh, again it's kind of following the same sort of line as the rest of them uh but one i did want to make sure we touch on is obviously betaine uh because that is where you have done a, a bunch of research in and it, we can maybe start with the whether or not it's pre-workout as a candidate or and i know there's potentially some other effects in terms of kind of chronic use like a creatine or something mm -hmm. Betaine is a, so it's, it's a uh, methionine with three methyl groups attached to it. So, uh, sorry, uh, trimethylglycine, not methionine. Um, and it's really rich in beets and uh, green leafy vegetables and to a lesser extent, shellfish. Um, now the Average like consumption in a human diet is about 400 to 500 milligrams per day. And most of the research that's been done looking at a ergogenic effect or a hypertrophic or lipolytic effect has used about two and a half grams per day or more. There was a study that was done. Uh, it's in review right now. It hasn't been published yet, but it, it did look at an acute dose of betaine on resistance exercise performance, and kind of as expected, it didn't show any benefit. So the use of betaine in a pre-workout is probably ineffective unless you're taking that pre-workout just about every single day. Um, now the ergogenic effects of betaine, when it's taken chronically for at least 10 to 14 days are kind of mixed. Some studies show a benefit. Most of those benefits tend to be in relation more to strength endurance than maximal strength, um, but not all studies. So the studies that I've done, we've, we've only tested one RM and vertical jump, and we haven't found any benefit uh, to betaine supplementation. And that's in both men and women ranging from six weeks to 12 weeks. Now, there is a study that I'm working on now that looked at it over the course of 14 weeks in, uh, in youth soccer players that showed a benefit to, to one RM, but by and large, the most resistance training athletes, most of the studies have not shown a benefit. Uh, when it comes to hypertrophic adaptations or, or changes in lean body mass, 
as far as I'm aware, only three studies have looked at it. No, I'm sorry, four have looked at it taken more than two weeks. Uh, two of those studies I conducted, one was in uh, young men uh, back at Springfield College when I was coaching or, or helping to coach the powerlifting and bodybuilding teams. And the other one that we did was in untrained young women. So in the untrained young men, we saw a change uh, in lean body mass, a significant improvement in, in lean body mass. In the young women, uh, we didn't. Now, the, the young men were eating uh, a sufficient amount of protein and calories, and the young women from their dietary records were not eating enough protein or calories. So maybe that explains the difference. There's also some gender differences in metabolism. Uh, the two other studies, one was done in that group of soccer players, and it showed no benefit in lean body mass. Uh, but then again, those players were not training for hypertrophy. You know, they were training mostly for uh, speed endurance and speed and, and aerobic capacity. So, uh, you know, let's kind of chalk that one in either hand. Uh, the other one, if I remember, was done in CrossFit athletes, uh, but it was a small sample size and there was no structured training. They were all just doing whatever CrossFit workout they wanted to do. So could it have been different if there was structured training and some sort of uh, dietary control? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the way betaine probably works as far as lean mass is as an intracellular osmolite. And what I mean by this is it basically pulls water into the muscles. So by hyperhydrating that muscle cell, it may provide a more hospitable environment for uh, protein synthesis and muscle contraction, or you know, the improvements we saw on lean mass could just be more intracellular water, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, there's tons of studies in pigs that show it improves uh, meat yield outcomes or you know, muscle outcomes. And then uh, there's some evidence that it may also help to uh, reduce fat mass, more than likely by uh, down-regulating the processes associated with lipogenesis or the building and storage of fats. And we see that less or greater decreases in fat mass in some of the human studies and then uh, a wealth of just uh, molecular outcomes and animals. So that's the, the, the rundown on betaine. Very interesting. I think some people's ears would have pricked up a little bit there because that sounds like there is some potential use for that as a supplement. How, out of interest, what is the, if you were recommending it for someone to take, would you, would it be a course of daily or would you recommend cycling it and what sort of um, intake in terms of like grams? Most of the research has used two and a half grams per day in terms of the ergogenic research and the body composition research. Um, it is used in higher doses to treat fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and hyperhomocystinemia. So it appears to be safe um, in dosages up to like 10 grams per day. Now, the way that we think betaine works is the, the metabolic stress of exercise causes the muscle cells to uptake more betaine. Um, and so by accumulating in the muscle cells and increasing the intracellular water content, uh, that is likely how betaine works. So it's probably a supplement that needs to be taken regularly to see an effect like, like a creatine or a beta alanine. You need time to build up in the tissues. It doesn't seem to matter whether you take it uh, on an empty stomach or with food. Its absorption is really high. Uh, food will slow the absorption, but it will not uh, decrease the amount absorbed. Because we're looking at you know, buildup in the tissues over time, it probably doesn't make a difference. As far as whether you take it once a day or twice a day, probably the same thing. Probably not going to make a difference. Um, because it is a, an osmolite, I, I would caution taking a high dose on an empty stomach as it may draw water into the intestines. And that could lead to some 
diarrhea or, or GI distress. Now, granted, we haven't, we didn't have any reports of that in our studies, but just something to consider. Very interesting. I guess it's it's one you could potentially stack with your creatine now. Then let's just I don't know include it, <laughs> include it alongside that, and so and. In, it sounds a little bit like some of the, not that it's the same, but obviously creatine is also stored in the muscle with water, whether or not that's part of the reason creatine also helps hypertrophy outcomes. So it's, it's very interesting to hear about that because it, it's not one I've massively looked into. I don't even know how commercially available like buying betaine is, but I'm sure there's some website will have it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty readily available. Uh, the only other note to mention is that there's two betaines on the market. There's betaine anhydrous, and then there's betaine hydrochloride. And so the betaine hydrochloride is basically just a delivery method for hydrochloride to improve digestion, particularly in people that don't uh, produce a lot of stomach acid. So if you're buying this as a, an ergogenic aid or a body composition enhancer, make sure to get the, the betaine anhydrous, not the hydrochloride. Perfect. No, that's that's really interesting. Um, that might be one that's on my shopping list soon <laughs> to just try it out. So, uh, in the uh, presentation, you went over some of the some of the emerging or novel supplements that are coming out. I don't know which of these potentially you've studied, but it was kind of going along the lines of like nootropics, hoopazine. That's one I've seen in quite a few kind of um, pre workouts recently, and like alpha GPC, uh, rhodolia. Uh, are there any of those that are kind of stick out for, to, to you that you'd like to talk about? Alpha GPC is an interesting one because there's uh, some studies that, that have pretty good control to them as well that show an improvement in force production and power output uh, with a week of use or two weeks of use. So that may be an interesting one to try, although I'm not aware of any studies that have looked to translate that into improvements in, uh, in lean mass. Uh, Rodilia has been around forever. I remember using that like 20 years ago and it kind of helps with fatigue, especially um, if, if one is sleep deprived. And so for that to have an effect, it probably needs to be paired with like a marathon type workout, just, you know, uh, 20, 25, 30 sets, like these two hour workouts that, uh, that, that some people do. So it, it probably needs to be paired with a really long duration, high volume workout. Um, I think now granted it's not a supplement, but one of the most overlooked pre-workout nutritions is, is simply carbohydrates. And it, it appears that if your workout lasts greater than about 40 minutes, then consuming carbohydrate pre-workout um, is going to have a beneficial effect on performance. And so by elevating your blood glucose or, or maybe by you know, consuming some sort of glucose during the workout as well, most people who are training for hypertrophy probably have workouts that are greater than 40 minutes. Um, so that's probably one of the most just overlooked ways that you can very effectively uh, and cheaply improve your, your, your workout performance. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. I know uh, it's interesting you talked about Rodelia with uh, being a sleep kind of if you're sleep deprived as one and kind of in marathon style of workouts because uh, Greg Potter, who's been on the podcast a few times, he's uh, got a PhD in sleep and I was talking to him about kind of are there any supplements I could take during like my overreaching weeks before deloading to like help with all the symptoms that you kind of get and Rodelia was one of the ones he mentioned so kind of it goes in line with what you were saying there and uh, yeah with the carbs sometimes it's the the most simple things um, in terms of the carbohydrates I don't know which ones were studied but would that be something like a dextrose or like a an easy to digest type of sugar so the studies that have been done that have used some sort of pre-workout 
carbohydrate ingestion, yeah, they, they've used glucose or dextrose. But in terms of just application, you probably want to match your carbohydrate source to the proximity to your workout. So if you're consuming something in, in close proximity, like five to 10 minutes before, you, you want something that is relatively easy to digest and fast absorbing. And if you're going to be consuming something a couple hours before, then you probably want a, maybe a larger meal with something that is a little bit slower digesting and absorbing. Awesome. Uh, with uh, obviously a lot of these supplements, we've kind of taken them one by one, uh, but I know pre-workouts in particular are they're all together. And uh, as many of us, well, some people might, might not realize, but they interact in different ways. And there's uh, people might know that like some vitamins, like if you have, like you max out all these vitamins, you don't have a, a pathway that can actually absorb them all at one time. Uh, there's been a few studies I think you may have been involved with that actually looked at like some pre-workout supplements. How, how, in terms of like looking at a pre-workout and how they've performed, how have they gone? The, the study that, that we did, um, so I have to, have to note here that it got cut incomplete due to a hurricane that hit uh, South Carolina when I was living and working at Coastal Carolina University and also uh, kind of damaged the product. So, so we're dealing with a small sample size as I'm discussing this. Um, on top of that, uh, it, it was really difficult to find a company to sponsor the type of study that I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, some of the major companies I've reached out to and they have no interest in sponsoring this. So basically my hypothesis and, and my belief is that pre-workout supplements are no more effective than an equal dose of caffeine. And maybe you like to feel the, the tingling and maybe you like the taste. Um, maybe you wanna feel the flush of niacin before your workout. Okay, sure. Uh, but for the average consumer and just for proof of principle, you know, popping a 200 milligram caffeine tablet is probably gonna be just as beneficial for a fraction of the cost. But that's just a hypothesis. We wanted to test that. And the, we did have a company that was very willing and interested to do so. And they wanted to create the best product possible. So they, they gave us product, they gave us caffeine and hydrous, they gave us a flavoring system to create the placebos. And we were able to test nine subjects under those three different conditions, randomized, double blind, pre-workout, equal dose of caffeine, placebo only. And we found no real benefit to the pre-workout. We found a slightly uh, greater number of quality squat repetitions compared to the two other conditions. And these were we had the subjects go down at a two second cadence and then try to um, generate as much power on the concentric movement. And we had them do these exercises to fatigue. And so we call it a quality repetition, a repetition that was done at or above 90% mean power. And with the pre-workout, we, we did see a benefit compared to caffeine and placebo, but that was it. In terms of overall repetitions, uh, no difference. So small sample size, but you know, some, some pilot work that, that suggests that uh, pre-workout might not be any better than caffeine. But there, like you said, there, there are so many different products out there. There's so many proprietary blends and so many different ingredients and doses and everything else that it, it's really difficult to to tell it's uh it says a lot when you're struggling to get anyone to sponsor the to sponsor the study because that in itself like i don't know that scares me that a company's like no we don't want to because we they're scared to i guess be i guess yeah they're scared cause they're not going to get the outcome that they want to see right yeah which uh I, yeah i mean i guess uh 
from what I see with the pre-workout supplement market, at least it's very based around flavorings, um, like, like fancy names and just big marketing and punchy names and things like this. And I mean, there's something to placebo for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're kind of fairly familiar with like placebos and how that, that can have a big role for people. And now maybe you've crushed a load of people's placebos uh, <laughs> with discussing these supplements and there's not really much there. But if we were to give people kind of a, in terms of what your practical recommendation would be, I guess it's having a carb, making sure that you've got some carbs within your pre-workout meal and making sure if they're close to the workout, make them kind of easier to digest, more sugar-based versus further away. You might want a more complex oat-based or something whole grain type of meal. Uh, and then potentially having, as many people know, just their, their caffeine. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried, I've got actually literally on my desk here, I've got L-theanine, which uh, sometimes I, I pair with if I have some caffeine because it seems to complement that. Is that something you've ever looked at, L-theanine? Um, I just want to back up one second. Okay. And I don't want to say that pre-workouts are equally effective to placebo because there are a number of studies that show that a variety of different pre-workout brands um, have an ergogenic effect compared to placebo. It's just a question of, are they more ergogenic than caffeine? And, and that's my, my thing. Um, as far as theanine goes, I've... I've tried theanine. I remember trying theanine like 20 years ago or, or 15, like a long time ago. And I have a, I think I have a caffeine supplement that has theanine in it. Um, but I don't really notice anything from it personally. And it's not something I've necessarily uh, looked into. So, you know, that, that's about as much as I can comment on theanine. Um, I, I do think one supplement that is not seen in any pre-workout supplements that I've seen that has an acute effect is capsaicin. So we've done in collaboration, I shouldn't say we, uh, some of my collaborators in Brazil that I've worked with, we've designed a, a number of studies looking at an acute dose of capsaicin on various types of performance. Uh, and we found that it does improve resistance exercise volume when taken acutely. Uh, and the most recent study that was just accepted, it's not published yet, but um, you know, give it like a couple of weeks and it'll be out in Journal of International Society of Sport Nutrition, showed a benefit to chronic capsaicin supplementation on lean mass outcomes. So for those who don't know what capsaicin is, it's the active compound in chili peppers that gives them their pungent or spicy or, or burning sensation. And so a dosage of anywhere from 15 to 20 grams, maybe as low as 12 grams, uh, about a half hour out from your workout might have an, an ergogenic effect. Mm. No. Like if you like that tingling sensation or that, that flushing sensation and niacin and you want something that has a beneficial effect acutely, adding some capsaicin might, your, your pre-workout might, uh, might accomplish that. I guess, does that have to be uh, like in a capsule? You can't, as a powder, I'm guessing that's pretty horrific potentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it has been a powder for, or a capsule form that's been ingested. So it bypasses the, uh, the oral right. mucosa and you don't get that burning sensation in your mouth um Perfect. I, don't know. I, I like that like i'm a you know i'm, I'm kind of a, a sadist when it comes to spice like the spicier yeah. and the, the more i'm sweating the better but i understand not everyone has those same uh cravings yeah <laughs> i guess i mean when we're well, like to just draw it really back with like bird's eye view we're, we're talking about supplements so where everyone hopefully will know they're kind of like the top of the pyramid in terms of they come after like the carbohydrate timing we we're talking about theoretically should I guess come before like a supplement that you're trying to uh, use as a ergogenic benefit but is that I, I don't know if you use a pre-workout regularly Jason but is that what you would advise potentially using the, the capsicum along with some caffeine uh, within your and maybe trying L-citrulline at some point maybe as well? Yeah, I think if you if your your nutrition is adequate, you're getting enough protein and carbohydrate and calories and et cetera, 
macro and micronutrients. Then certainly taking some caffeine before your training will improve your performance. Um, the, the verdict is still not quite in yet whether habitual caffeine use reduces its ergogenic effect. Um, it was a study that just hit my PubMed filter this morning that said in resistance exercise, habitual caffeine use doesn't uh, impact the ergogenic effect. But most of the caffeine and pre-workout supp supplement studies that are done ask the subjects to refrain from caffeine several days prior. So if you're a habitual user and you refrain from caffeine, then you know that you get some withdrawal effects. I mean, it's highly individualized how bad these are gonna be, but it's possible that the changes we see in performance um, in habitual users when they're asked to refrain is not so much an improvement in performance, but simply the caffeine brings them back up to like their baseline. Uh, so we, we did a study and we're still in the process of analyzing all the data uh, in regards to caffeine ingestion, genetics, and resistance exercise performance. But we also collected uh, habitual caffeine intake. And so we'll see if there's any sort of interaction there as well. But, but definitely, you know, caffeine's kind of a, a staple that can help you to improve your performance. Um, in terms of like some of the, the real high caffeine dose pre-workouts, my recommendation would be to, to use them sparingly. So, you know, maybe on your weakest workout, save it for, for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, people are like tired after work and then they're using this pre-workout that's got like three to like 400 milligrams of caffeine and they're going to bed in a few hours it's like that's that's going to be a recipe for disaster <laughs> so it's a shame like the one clear supplement that has that ergogenic benefit like that's fairly pertinent is the caffeine and we have to be very careful how we use that because sleep is so damn important uh so uh yeah it's it's um like I said, uh, especially natural bodybuilders, we're always looking for every little edge we can get with every supplement. So we're hoping there's something there. And uh, I guess, unfortunately, there's, there's not a whole lot there, but you've certainly elucidated um, some potential avenues for some potential benefits from caffeine, uh, sorry, from various, well, it was the betaine, um, the, the capsicum and things like this. So that was very interesting to hear about. Uh, I think we're coming up to an hour, Jason. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to include. I think we include, we covered a lot in terms of pre-workout supplementation and kind of what you can do there and various kind of uh, going through various supplements. But uh, otherwise I can leave the listeners with how to learn more from you. Let's do that. Yeah. I don't really have anything else to, to include. Um, Perfect. So uh, I'm on Instagram, I'm not very active on it, but I am on it. And my handle is at dr.redperformance. Um, I have a, Facebook page, Big Red Physical Performance, that, again, not quite active on it. Um, then you can always go to my website, which is jasonkaliva.com. Perfect. And is that where, if people are interested in, like, your coaching or they can find your research in PubMed and things like this, they search it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're interested in my coaching, you can go to that website, and uh, or you can just DM me on one of the social media platforms. and. Uh, and we can chat, uh, or if you want to talk shop as well, same thing. Um, you can search for my last name on PubMed. Um, there is another, a couple other Kalivas that are over in Poland that are are doing work, and and one happens to be a sports scientist, and his name is Janisaw Kaliva. Uh, I think it's pronounced Janisaw <laughs> Kaliva. Um, and then the other one is doing. Uh, up to you, some biomedical research. So yeah, you, you might find some some stuff up there that, yeah. that is not from me, but you can always look me up on ResearchGate as well. A lot of my uh, articles are, are up there too, but always uh, email me and I'd be happy to talk. Email is jason.m.kaliva at gmail.com. Fantastic. I'll make sure uh, so people don't have to remember they're, they're in the description below. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Jason. It's, it's been a really interesting chat. I think people will have taken a lot away from this. And uh, thank you to everyone for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. My pleasure.
So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We cap them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.